Meet my friend William Baines. He's a biochemist, he's at MIT, he can play the guitar like nobody's business, and he also looks a little bit like a leprechaun. Well, in 2004, he wrote an article, a book, about biotechnology from A to Z. Then, in 2004 again, many chemistries could be used to build living systems. The idea here is to maybe life is, can be based on another sol solvent, not just water. And then in 2008, venture capital and European biotechnology industry. Well, he's got many interests, biotechnology and astrobiology. In 2014, he wrote an article called, What Do We Think Life Is? A Simple Illustration and Its Consequences. Then, in more recently, 2017, in collaboration with Dirk schultz makuch he wrote a book about cosmic zoo, complex life on many worlds. He's the kind of guy who thinks that complex life will be everywhere in the universe, and so we should try to figure it out. Matter of fact, 2018, time to consider search strategies for uh, complex life on exoplanets. Well, I sat down with him in Washington, Seattle, Washington, and I asked him, are we alone? My name is William Baines. And what do you do? I do lots of different things, but um, my background is as a biochemist, and so I'm interested in the chemistry of life and, from a practical point of view, how it goes wrong. Oh. All right. And are we alone in the universe? Well, that depends what you mean by alone. I mean, is there life somewhere else? Out of, what, 400 million stars, most of which have planets, hundreds of millions of galaxies, is there another planet out there somewhere that has something like life on it? I would think that seems likely. Um, and you're only talking about our galaxy, 400 billion stars. Well, no, I think our galaxy and all the other galaxies anywhere in the universe, is there life on it? Probably. Oh, so um, tend to the observable universe or the entire yeah. universe you're talking about? Observable universe. Okay, so, you, so I, say, I ask you, are we alone and you think Probably not. Because? Because I just think that would be extraordinarily unlikely. We'd need, a, we'd need a life on Earth to be a spectacularly unlikely event for it to only have happened once on one planet in the entire observable universe. How do you know it's not a spectacularly unlikely event? I don't. It's just that I tend not to prefer to base theories on things that are spectacularly unlikely. So, you know, spectacularly unlikely things are just spectacularly unlikely to happen. Um, but we may be. And, and this is the problem. We don't know. We've only got one example. And we're hugely biased in observing that example. Because if there wasn't life on Earth, then we wouldn't be here to say, hey, there's no life on Earth. So there has to be life where we are observing it. So we can't count that as a sample. Okay. And when I asked you, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? Um, Specifically, humans generally Earth life, and uh, so we tend to think of, of you know we meaning us, and we meaning you know me and you and our kids, um, and then more broadly than that, humans. And then we think, well, that's a bit you know humans are a trace contaminant on the planet, so um, Earth type life. And do you, are viruses alive? You're including oh, viruses in the we? viruses, goodness, our virus is alive. This is one that... Well, that, do you include viruses in your we? Um, viruses are part of Earth life. Okay, um, well, then you do. So, but, you know, um, prions are part of Earth life. Um, dead wood is part of Earth life in the sense that it wouldn't be here if there wasn't Earth life. Coal is part of Earth life. So, you know, our virus is living things. They do the things we think living things should do. Um, I used to think definitely yes, and then I thought definitely no, and now I'm swinging back towards yes again. Um, I think this, uh, but, but asking whether viruses are alive really is asking what do you mean by life. Right, and so what do, you, what do you mean by life? I'm not sure I know what I mean by life. So um, why do you think we are not alone if you don't know what the word life means? I said I'm not sure what I mean. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the, the a characteristic feature of life, this isn't a definition and this is not an exhaustive list, but a characteristic feature is coded replication. So we've got information inside us and that describes what we should be and what the next generation of us should be. So if I eat a banana, there's something inside me that says some bits of the chemicals in that banana should be me and some bits should not be me and some bits should be turned into me. 
And that's different for me than any other phenomenon on the planet. And that's a characteristic and, dif and importantly characteristic feature of life. If we find some bacteria-like microbes on Mars, does that mean that we're not alone? Well, Mars is a difficult case because we're pretty sure that Mars was uh, Earth-like, for lack of a better word, a uh, planet back early in the solar system. So it had um, an atmosphere, it had surface water, but there was, a, there was almost certainly exchange of material between, you know, the Earth and Mars. And meteorites hit one and splash rocks off and they went across the other and so on. So if we find life on Mars, and if it looks pretty much chemically like life on Earth, then it could have originated independently, or it could be just Earth life contaminating Mars. Mm -hmm. And then that doesn't tell us anything about whether we're alone or not. It, it's it, because there was only one originating event. If there was life on Mars that was chemically radically different from Earth, then we'd say, well, that probably didn't, that probably wasn't contamination from Earth to Mars in the early days. That was two events. And if we found that, then we I would be very confident we're not alone in the I mean, apart from the fact we then have life on Mars, which would not, which still be life. A, a lot of people have a higher threshold for what they're calling alone, and, and they want to find some intelligent thing they can talk to before they will say that they're not alone. And if they find microbes somewhere, they say, oh, I don't care about that, I, I'm still alone. Yeah. You're not so, in that camp? Um, I'm not in that camp for two reasons. Firstly, I think I think that the big difference for me, and I'm a biochemist, so I have to look at things chemically and biochemically. So the big difference for me is the d chemical and, and sort of information differences between, um, between non-living things, rocks and oceans and things on one hand, and living things on the other. If you find a living thing... Wait, 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 you just said the ocean is not alive? Is that what you said? That's what I said. I said the ocean is not alive. You'll stick with that opinion. I will stick with that opinion. And also I'm, just... I'm fairly sure that's not an opinion you will stick with. <laughs> so you didn't like the, the book Solaris, then, by Lem? Uh, but, that, but that wasn't an Earth ocean. That was an alive ocean. I, I, <laughs> I thought the book was fantastic, and the original Russian film of it was fantastic. Oh, the subsequent I'd... film wasn't so good. But anyway, that's a, that's a digression. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in chemical. But yeah, you know, people want something they can, they can talk to. And that's, so for me, there are, there are two steps to go from is it alive to can we talk to it. And the first is can you get, for lack of a better word, comp complex life. It's complex is not a good term. Um, for reasons I'm sure you, you, we can argue about. Um, but life that has you know, um, complicated anatomy, complicated physiology, a long developmental program rather than single cells, and life that programs that within itself, like we do. So we start out with a fertilized egg, and all conditions being well, you end up with a human being and not a giraffe or an oak tree. So that's sort of an well, Are we program. more complicated than a giraffe or an oak tree? Not more complicated than a giraffe. I would think we're more complicated than an oak tree. Really? Yeah. I Why think, do you say that? Because we've got more cell types. And Why do you say we have more cell types? Because I've counted them. You, have you spent as much time counting oak tree cell types as you have human cell types? Because often the number of cell types depends on how long you've looked at something. Yeah. Um, I've spent a reasonable amount of time looking at cell types in different sorts of organisms. And well, I'm pretty sure that plants are less complicated than animals. Do you think humans have the most number of cell types? No, I, th I think all, all vertebrates are essentially indistinguishable on number of cell oh. types. So you think that vertebrates are all equally complicated? On a cell type level, yes. Okay. On a brain level, not necessarily, but now, now this the question, brain's a different are thing. we alone? Now, is this an important question? This is an important Important to who and important what way? Um, is it important to you? I mean, I think it is important. I think it's important because finding out you know, what, where we are, what our place is, has always been important to, to humans. And, it's, and it's, a, it's sort of one of the things that distinguishes us from, from other species, as far as we know. We don't know what you know, giraffes think about. But certainly humans have always thought, what is the... You know, why am I here? Where am I going? What's around me? What's the nature of everything around about? Um, and I think this is a, a scientific 21st century answer or approach to that question. So, you know, is, are we completely unique in the universe? Is there something really weird about us? Um, or is there something else we can talk to? Well, now you're using the word us. Humans. Humans. So yeah. now the question, are we alone, has become, are we humans alone? 
So that's what you ask. You said, you know, somebody we can talk to. So in that case, alone is alone as an intelligent, talking, communicating species. Okay, so you think this is an important question for you, but a lot of people out in the street don't care about this question. What, uh, but you and I do. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think it's, it's, the, it's a sort of cast of mind and a way of looking at the world. I've, I've always wanted to look at things and, and understand what's going on on the surface, understand why things happen. Um, so Does it make you a better person to have your life examined in such an evolutionary way? I don't think it's better. I think it's, it's different. Um, you know, I mean, some people are absolutely dedicated to learning baseball scores or um, cookery or something, and uh, th I think they're, you know, they can be fine people too. It's not what I happen to be interested in. I see. So this scientific story of Genesis is important, but it's not so important that you think everybody should know it. I think everybody should understand that there is some understanding, and that people are, you know. Scientists, society as a whole, is getting more understanding of what really happened um, back in evolutionary and paleontological time, um, what the universe is really like, why, to the extent we know anything about it, how we came to be here. Um, I think people understanding that there is knowledge there and that it's reliable knowledge and it was gained through a reliable process that we call science, I think that's important. What it is, do you think, wait, do you yeah. think chimpanzees should know that? Dogs should know that? Well, this isn't, that, that, so this is um, Martin Rees, the UK astronomer's royal question, you know. Um, do chimpanzees understand quantum mechanics? And his answer is, well, no, of course not. Nobody really understands quantum mechanics. It's, it's one of those weird things you can't get your brain around. But his point was that chimpanzees cannot even comprehend that there is a type of explanation called quantum mechanics. So I don't think we can explain this to chimpanzees. I don't... I, or most people. Um, most people understand there is something called quantum mechanics and it's jolly clever and it's about how really? stuff works. Well, um, we'll do a survey. Is yeah. there something called quantum mechanics? I'm, well, pitched, I'm, I'm not quite sure that'll be more than 50%. That, that, that might actually be... Um, <laughs> it, it, it is unfortunately a sad state of, of <laughs> yeah. certainly Western education that um, if you ask, you know, uh, uh, people whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth, there is a fraction that right. said, I right. don't know. Right. Um, so what part of your research is most relevant to assessing the probability of life elsewhere? There are two, there are two, two parts to my astrobiological research. Um, one is much more chemical and it's much more focused on how we might detect life elsewhere. So now, that's related to what sort of chemical environment do you need um, to sustain life, and that's a little bit related to the question of what chemical environment you need to start life, where, but so it can be there, but um, only very r loosely related to that. Um, I think that is important when you know, the next generation or the generation after that of big space telescopes is designed. You say, what are we looking for? And we can input into that. So that helps define the technology um, and the science behind finding out if we're alone. Predicting whether we're alone, I, I, um, I'm interested in and starting to look at, as you, as you know, um, how complex life, complicated life evolves. If you've got life on a planet, does it then evolve oak trees and giraffes. Well, and let's ask you that question molds. then. Let's suppose that there are other planets, Earth-like planets, with water and life on them. What fraction of them do you think will develop uh, radio telescopes? Well, that's two questions. So, well, no, no, it's one question. I said, let's assume that there are lots and lots of Earth-like planets mm. and that they have, sure. and some fraction of them have life. So let's look at that fraction. Right. And then ask, I'm asking you the question, what, what the fraction of that fraction? Right do you think will have intelligent life on which, in other words, once you okay. have life, do you think it develops? But that's why I say that's, that's two questions bundled into one. Um, there's how many develop complicated life, so life like giraffes and oak trees. And then out of those, how many develop a technological intelligence? Okay, so give me two answers. Two answers. Complex life, the short answer is, I think, a lot of them. A lot um, means more than half or something. More than half. Mm -hmm. um, 
the majority of life on those planets will not be not be complicated. The majority of life on our planet is, is not complicated. It's bacteria, it's um, single-celled algae. You know, we're we're a small, small fraction. But we're interested in that small fraction. We're very biased. Um, so once you have life on a planet, you think most of that life will, of course, on every planet, the, a large fraction of those planets will have some intelligent species, as if we'll there's an, some, not intelligent. I take it back. Yeah, more complicated, more complicated, complex species. Okay. With some of those, will have, um, will probably have complicated behavior. They'll have something analogous to a nervous system that allows them to detect the environment, manipulate the environment, mm -hmm. and the the precedent on Earth says that some of those will be smart in the sense that they can um, use simple objects in the environment with tools. They can learn behaviors and have cultures of, okay. of learnt behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, a lot of the crows do that. The number of the primates do that. Um, a couple of the cephalopods do that, independently evolved on Earth. So OK. How many of those could then, on those worlds, how many would then make the jump to technological intelligence? And related to that, what, how, what do you mean by technological? You mean the ability to build a tel radio telescope? The ability to yeah to 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 build to build a radio telescope, let's say. Um, and related to that, is how long will that last? Because if you can only build tel radio telescopes for a hundred years, and then you cease to be able to build radio telescopes, the chances of us finding that civilization at precisely that point in time mm -hmm. is is tiny. So. Um, the answer to that is I don't know, um, and I genuinely. So you know, it's only ha as far as we know, it's only happened once on Earth. There have been smart species around for a long time, at least species that are anatomically no different from species that are smart today. They've been around for a long time. There's only been one technological species, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. Well, let's play. Let's replay um, the tape of life on Earth and say, do you think uh, technological radio telescopes will come again? So well, let's re just play God and replay the tape millions of times yeah. and do his experiment. Monte Carlo simulation. What fraction but of this the is this 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 is why I say I don't know because what what drove a particular species of primate to make that jump from banging rocks together to radio telescopes? You know? So chimps use rocks as, as tools. Um, gorillas use tools. Orangutans use tools. Um, but none of them build radio telescopes. Only humans do that. And yeah, but most humans don't build radio telescopes. Well, humanity builds radio telescopes, <laughs> and this is the interesting thing. Um, you know, you put a human being down in the in the jungles of Gombe with where the uh, chimpanzees live, and they'd be far worse off at making things than chimpanzees. I mean, chimpanzees are you know, obviously better adapted to that environment, but the average human being is um, is 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 almost helpless. But as a group. They've got this sort of group shared intelligence thing, which means that as a society, as a group, we can build radio telescopes, write symphonies, you know. Well, let's go, when we do our replays, let's not go back to the beginning or even pre Cambrian. Let's go back, let's say, 30,000 years mm. and ask to do the same experiment. Do you think then that most of these, like Cro Magnum Man, do you think? Oh, that, yeah, absolutely. So once you have Cro Magnum so, Man, you think that you will uh, evolve into a radio telescope building civilization? Cer certainly back 70,000, 80,000 years. Um, so you go back 100,000 years, it probably goes down? Well, there was some sort of transition, and it's a very big, big time slice. About, and this is from memory, because this isn't really my field right, of expertise, okay. but from right. memory, there are, um, there are traces in caves in South Africa of human cultural groups that were um, making pigments and um, by collecting rocks from a number of different places, collecting shells to grind them up in, and, and manufacturing stuff. And you think that's an important step towards building a radio telescope? I think that's, that's putting something together that never existed in nature and deliberately going out and collecting stuff and to do it. Not just saying, hey, here's a rock, this is about the right shape, I'll crack this nut with it, but thinking, what do I need? having an imagination to think, what do I need here in my hand that I don't have now, mm -hmm. I can now go out and get put mm -hmm. together. I think once you've got that, the path from there to flint axes, to farming, to cities, to radio telescopes is highly probable. Really? Why makes you say that? Because it seems to be this, it's, it's incremental. It's the, same, it's the same sort of thought process. Well, it's certainly incremental in our history 
whether it's incremental in general is another issue. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, but th those are things that only humans have done, as far as we know. Uh, yeah. It's the same sort of thought process. It's thinking, what would I like to do, which I can't do with things around me now, so how do I get those things? Mm. It's also about trading. So um, again, fossil remain or, or archaeological remains at the same sort of time suggested those groups were trading with each other. So one of them says, you know, um, I want to make this pigment. I want to you know, paint the walls of my cave. Um, I haven't got some whatever, red ochre. I'll talk to those guys over there. Mm. I'll give them some fish. They'll give me some red ochre. I can mix my paint up. That is a sort of exchange. Even Neanderthals, we don't think, did that. Well, it was homo fungi sergeants. and plants do that. But that, that is a pre-programmed response. This is a learned response. Oh. And, and so you build the culture on that learned response. Now, if I give you a hundred billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars with a uh -huh. caveat, you have to spend this to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? A hundred billion dollars, are we alone? Um, in that someone to talk to spent sense. Whatever sense you'd like. <clears throat> Nobody's given me a hundred dollars to answer that question, so that's a tricky one to okay. um, you, so just think. To, hey, money is no object. Money is no object. Money I, is no object. I, what I, do I you understand do? the money is no object concept. Um, so we can't go there, and we can't go there because wherever there is. So we can't go there um, outside the solar system because the speed of light limits, l limits us. We, you know, wait, wait, maybe there are aliens living five kilometers underneath this building. Well, they fairly, need to be fairly small aliens. Yes, yes. Okay. So you're talking about alien life. You're talking about things like the shadow, shadow biosphere. Or well, maybe they're from another planet and they came to our planet. They lived underneath it and they're saying, hey, let those surface people do what they want. And well, if they're doing that, they're doing it fairly quietly. It means they, yes, they, yes. They, don't, quiet they don't want to be discovered, which means we're going to have difficulty <laughs> discovering them. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, a lot of the aliens among us stuff, every time somebody says, yeah, well, you know, there are aliens in Antarctica. Well, now we've got lots of people running around Antarctica. Oh, well, they're actually now, they're under Antarctica. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. and, it, and they keep on retreating. It's as, called the aliens of the margins. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Um, so... The obvious answer is, is really big space inter interferometry telescopes. So you can actually image distant planets, get really detailed chemical spectral data of them, say, you know, does that look like a planet that's got life on it? So um, that, that'll take up only, I don't know, a couple of billion? Oh, no, that, that's... Ten billion? Um, each, that's going to take ten billion just to develop. It's probably going to take 20, 30 billion. Okay, I mean, so I, that's I'm, a third of your money. What are you going to do with the rest? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about... You know, mirrors the size of a football pitch. Okay. A dozen of them in um, in the same orbit of the Earth, all the way all the way around the sun. So you have a mirror with the effective size of 180 million miles across. Okay. Um, something big, you know, okay. not, not not these little and things. How many of them? Oh, I need need that physicist. Probably about 20. 20 of these giant mirrors, yeah. and it's going to cost I don't know 30, maybe even 50 billion dollars. 50 billion dollars. So you spend half your wad. Now what are you going to yeah. do with the rest? Um, I'd put a small chunk, I mean a few billion, you know, pocket change, um, into SETI, into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh -huh. I think it's an outside chance. Okay. Um, uh -huh. and, we, and we never really finished discussing about sort of what happens to technology after we got radio telescopes. Oh. But, but, you know, I think it's an outside chance. Um, but I think it's worth, you know, if you're looking for someone to talk to, what you need to do is look for someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not just look for algae. Yes. What would I do with the rest of it? Um, I think there's some, I think I'd fund anybody with any proposal up to say $10 million. Mm. And I mean anybody <laughs> um, who had an idea for the origin of life research. I see. Because I think we, my, my personal view, and this is not a view shared by most scientists in the field, but my personal view is that origin of life research now is like solar astronomy in the mid 19th century. So we know lots about light, you know, they knew lots about the sun, they knew its rotation, they knew its color, they knew its, uh, its sunspots, they knew its map. They had no idea how it worked. And the theories around right work said, you know, well, maybe it's infalling rocks heating the surface up. 
maybe it's burning or something, and they were missing at least two fundamental things that they could not possibly know. One was how old the sun was. So, you know, if the sun's made of coal and it's burning, that's fine if it's been around for 5,000 years, but if it's been around 4 billion, obviously it doesn't work. And the other was that there existed something called nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. There existed something called the, the nucleus. You know. it, it not merely that they didn't know about it, they didn't know there was something there to know. Mm -hmm. I suspect origin of life research is the same thing. It's not merely that we don't know how to answer the question. We don't even know what the missing pieces are that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that just might come out of you know, something that professional, sensible, established scientists would regard as mad, but somebody's got that germ idea. Now, nearly all that money would be completely wasted. It would be pumped into either the same stuff that's going on now, which is good, good stuff and interesting, but you know, it's, it's, it's incremental, or it'll go into the people who are frankly slightly off their rocker and really don't know what they're doing. But there's a, just a chance that some of it would reach the one person who cannot get funded at all because they're working in you know, a, a Swiss post office and have a brilliant idea. So this is going to be half of your money? You're going to do the scattershot approach? I do. I, for this particular project, I don't know. I'd put, I uh, say, five billion or something. Would you give any to philosophers? Certainly not. <laughs> Disgraceful waste of time. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, philosophers, linguists, Mime artists, I mean, anybody, Mime artists. anybody who think they could um, you know, contribute to saying, how did life happen? How about, would you give me some money to buy an electron telescope, electron microscope to look for nano aliens in this room? But I don't think that's origin of life, unless you thought they were originally no, this independent. This looking for aliens. These are alien micro oh, right. spaceships, um, nano spaceships. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, sorry, I, I, okay, I, I, another... I think that's a very creative idea, but no, come on. Okay, uh, how, about, how about if I was convinced that I, you know how your neurons inside your brain don't know that they're inside your brain? They don't know that they're part of you. Now, could we be inside of an alien and not know that we are? Well, I, uh, I don't think your neurons know anything. <laughs> right, yeah. well, maybe people your brain don't know anything knows. either. Your brain, knowing something is a... Is well, I think a, they know how a, to function. They know, hey, I got... No, do, 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 no, 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 no. But what no suggests you've got some overarching concept of something. Really? Which is a system's property, the brain. It's not an individual neuron property. Any, so anymore. all brains know things. Brains know things. But cells do not. Cells do not. Really? Yeah. Because otherwise cells you say... Cells don't know anything. You say, well, a cell doesn't know... And that the doesn't cell sound, knows this. So, okay... Does, does the DNA in it, does that protein know something? If the protein knows it, does that atom know something? Is it hot something? over there? Is there oxygen over here? Am I getting a cell a thing in here? Is it too acidic here? Oh, it it all can that. sense things. It well, can respond to things. Knowing. It sense processes things. I see. Well, you're not a Barbara McClintockian who says that every part of an organism is as much an organism as the whole organism. Mm, definitely not. Okay. All right. Um, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. But there's this Canadian-German uh, uh, philosopher who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be ind indistinguishable from nature, i.e., if you become advanced, you become more ecologically sustainable, maintenance, zero growth, you know, you're mm -hmm. compatible with non-growth or something. So what do you think of that? I think that's very 21st century. <laughs> and um, okay. it, it might I, well, but but that's essentially the same. I, I mean, those are different ways of saying a, a very similar thing. Well, if it's so, true, it's bad news for SETI, right? Yeah, I mean, but but you know, think of a hyper advanced society where anybody can do what they want. You know, equivalent to um, the Star Trek, you know, transporters and um, whatever the beamy things are they take their tr food trays out of and all the rest. But do that, but with zero net energy input in the environment and so on. So you just wave your hand and stuff happens, but it doesn't disturb the world around you in any way. That's magic. I mean, that's Harry Potter. That's so, so uh, you know, I, I don't think those two, those two are different statements. They're just saying, what would the magical technology technologists want to do no. and how will they want to do it. It is bad news for SETI in that if that super advanced civilization says we're going to have 
zero um, impact on mm -hmm. the world, the, or the, minimize, the system, minimize. or minima, or the galaxy, then they could be really hard to detect. Um, okay, well, you have a, a couple of hundred billion left. Uh, I have the idea of maybe I should look for vacuum energy fluctuations as a form of alien consciousness. You going to give me $10 million for that? If you can give me some faint idea how you might detect a vacuum energy fluctuation. Well, I, do, I guess I do casimir, casimir experiments on different scales to see how uniform the vacuum fluctuations are and try to detect some non-uniform patterns. To okay, that sounds like <laughs> but nano, I mean, That is okay, but nano I, it's not. <laughs> well, no, because coming out of that, you'll learn something about the vacuum fluctuation. Um, anyway, well, looking for nano aliens, you're going to really get better at looking at really tiny stuff because right now they throw away anytime they see something they don't understand in the highest mi highest magnification, they just throw it out. They don't investigate it. Right. Well, in which case, why don't you have ten million dollars to Piggyback put, put, on a, it, right? put an image image collector on every single electron microscope? Well, they that's what they do, those. but they just throw right now. They're throwing them out. Okay. Do you have, you know what the Fermi paradox is? Do you ah. have any favorite solutions to it? Yeah. Um, so my favorite solution is that as soon as uh, civilization, or culture, species, whatever you want to call it, reaches a level of technology where, it, where being intelligent is no longer a survival, a physical survival um, benefit, then it starts to become dumb. Oh. And rapidly after that, um, so, so, you know, intelligence goes up and up and up and up and up because it's a selective advantage. You know, if you're um, smart enough to work out how to get more food or to circumvent your neighbor's attempt to kill you or to farm better or to breed better or whatever, build better houses, um, manipulate the political system, whatever it is, then you, you survive longer, you breed more, that passes on your genes, you're selecting for intelligence. And at some point, suddenly that ceases to be true. We don't let stupid people starve. We don't let disadvantaged children die. These are all good things. These are not bad things to do. They're good, humane things to do. But it means there's not a selection against loss of intelligence. And intelligence is very costly, so um, in physiological terms, because you, have to, you know, have to keep some sort of intelligence machine running. So you start to get dumb. And my guess is you get dumb quite fast. It certainly seems to be happening with people. And and you are no longer able to innovate, you're no longer able to maintain your own technology, and you drop back. Now, whether so, you catastrophically crash and you become extinct, or whether you drop back to you know, half a million people scattered over the globe and then come back again is another matter. So if, but that's my solution, the Fermi paradox. Uh, if that's, if that's you've correct. got radio telescopes for 100 years, and then you lose them again. So if that vision of our history is correct, you can ask the question, when were we most smart? When were we the smartest? 18th century. 18th century. <laughs> You're such an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but come on, that's, that's okay. when, you know, that, that was when all the great political okay. revolutions happened, was when the US was founded. No. Um, you know, we've got Ben Franklin and Isaac Newton. I mean, so spread it a bit either way, you know, a couple okay. of hundred years. No, anyway, we're on the downward slope. We're on the downward slope now. It's all downhill from here, guys. <laughs> but it'll be fun, okay, because we have spectacular technology to keep us going. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. What was your favorite solution to Fermi's Paradox? Um, that's broadcasting te civilizations are really short-lived, short, okay. essentially. So short-lived. Um, so there are many out there that are just short-lived and therefore far, they're far apart from each other. Well, they may be. They, um, there may not be many up. I mean, we don't know what drove, drove the jump from reasonably smart, adaptable, but not technological organism to, 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 to human beings that had tools and did trading and, and had right. creativity and imagination. We don't know. That might be rare. But even if it's common, I think it will be very self-limiting and that it'll be cut off quickly. So there may be a number out there, but you know, the nearest one might have been only 50 light years away. But yeah. it was only around for 100 years, 170 million years ago. Do you have another favorite solution? Is that the only one that you like? Well, you only have one favorite. OK. You know? I mean, right, that's, right, by right. definition, that's a favorite. You can have many favorite my ice cream. My second favorite, okay. my slightly less favorite, but okay. my second favorite, is, is the reverse, that we go, you know, that if, you, if we're not getting dumb, or, if, or we're getting dumber fairly slowly, mm -hmm. our technology is accelerating so much that within 50, 100 years, we'll become incomprehensible to ourselves, or, or to us now. So we'll still be around, 
or something will be around. Um, but we won't be using radio. We'll, you know, we'll, we won't be using radio any more than we use fires in the middle of the room to cook food. We'll be um, doing something else. Okay. Um, uh, have you I, ever seen a UFO? Yes. Tell me about it. Um, so I saw an unidentified flying up. So I was on, when I was an undergraduate at Oxford, uh, I was living out in digs at the north of the town. And I was walking out one evening in a slightly inebriated state because that's why I wasn't cycling out. And I saw these lights and the light in the sky, and it was just hovering there. And it was, uh, and it was sort of subtly fluctuating and changing color, red, orange, yellowy color. I thought, wow. That is an authentic, genuine UFO. And so being a scientist, I watched it, and it drifted north. And I walked north. I spent about an hour walking north in the field and watched it gradually coming down until it came over the lights of Kittlington Airport, which is an airport about four or five miles north. And I realized then it was a light aircraft that didn't have its wing lights on. And what I was seeing was the cockpit lights and the one light underneath oh. the aircraft. So it was unidentified. Mm -hmm. It was flying. It was an object. Mm -hmm. But instead of saying, oh, wow, this must be an alien, I said, let's find out what it is. Mm -hmm. And I found out it was an airplane. So then it became an identified flying object. When it was still an unidentified flying object, how likely do you, th in your brain, did you say, oh, it's an alien spaceship? I thought that was pretty unlikely. I thought. So what was the interest in following it then? I wanted to find out what it was. Okay. You know, I, I, I want to, um, I want to unpack things. Usually... I want to find out okay. what happens. Okay. I want to find out why. Okay. Now, uh, what do you know about aliens? Nothing. Uh, have you ever been abducted by aliens? No. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, now let me ask the emotional <laughs> side of you. Um, <laughs> what, so close your eyes a little bit, okay. and I'm going to ask you, what kind of alien would you like to find emotionally? <sighs> what kind of alien would I like to find? Um, I think one a long, long way away. <laughs> Are you afraid of aliens? Um, Do you agree that with Stephen Hawking that we should keep our heads down? I think Stephen Hawking had a good point on that. Um, and that's why you want to find an alien that's long, a long, long way away. Long I, I think the. So you want to stay so, alone then? <laughs> I'd like to know that we're not alone, but you know, it's, it's, sort of, it, it's sort of like knowing the friendly, friendly neighbors down the street. It's nice to know they're there, but you don't want to see them every day. I um, I, the problem is, if, if we, you know, we're, we're at a very early stage of technological development, and if we are going to get through the sort of getting dumber crisis, which I, I fear is facing us, um, and if other species can do that, then we're very early on that path. So the chances we find another intelligent technological alien, and it's going to be way, way in advance. Mm -hmm. Historical precedent says that primitive groups contacted by very much more technologically advanced groups don't do that well. Um, I'm not sure I want that to happen to and You think humanity. that's a universal feature of intelligent life forms? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Um, uh, do you think that we are, the, I think Carl Sagan said this, that we are the way for the universe to be conscious of itself. What do you think of that comment? I think he just read Olaf Stapleton's Star Maker. Mm -hmm. um, okay, would you, so, you think that's a statement that you would agree with or disagree with, or you have any objection to that statement? I don't think it, I don't think it has any meaning. So you don't I think, think consciousness, human consciousness is such a, re a revolutionary thing that we should celebrate and say, now the universe is conscious of itself? No, I, I think, I think it is quite, it's, it's apparently unique, the nature of human thought and human self-awareness. Other animals can be demonstrated to be aware of themselves. They can recognize, for example, if their own image in a mirror is not them, it reflects them, and, and therefore they must have some idea that they are them. Um, we seem to have a very heightened level of that, and I think that probably relates to our nature of storytelling animals. So we, we, we love telling stories. Um, and in order to tell a story, so, you, know, well, I was, I, you know, I was walking into a bar the other day, and I sat down next to this guy and turned around. He was this friend from school. You have to know who you are and who they are, and you've got a shared history and all this. You have to have some sense of identity. Um, and, and I think 
our heightened consciousness and our love of telling stories um, is, is all intertwined. Is it a heightened consciousness or just a different kind of consciousness? Um, I, I don't know what other kinds of consciousness there could be, so I can't say. Okay. I mean, the other thing is I, I don't actually know you're conscious at all. Um, okay. So are you a solipsist? Um, I do have a certain amount of solipsism going on. I know I'm, I'm reasonably sure I'm conscious. We have a solipsist looking to see if we're alone or not. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Have you seen uh, the movie Contact? Yeah. All right, now in the movie, several times, char one character asks another, are we alone? And the answer comes back, well, if we're alone, it would be an awful waste of space. What do you think of that? Well, that assumes the space is there for a purpose. You don't waste it if, it, if it's there for a purpose. I, so that presumes that... The purpose is to produce life. Something made the universe, and the purpose is to have the universe occupied by conscious thing. But it... If there was a, I don't believe there is a purpose, but if there was, you might say it's just there to look pretty. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, why do we have Christmas trees? It's not so they can be conscious, it's just so they look pretty. Oh. Okay, so, so you don't think it would be a waste of space if we never find other life forms elsewhere? No, I mean, the, the universe is as it is. If, if there's no other life in the entire universe, I say that would be slightly unexpected because statistically, why is there only one and and not lots? But um, if that's how it is, that's how it is. Do you think that we are the only English-speaking creators in the universe? Probably. So you think that English is in a different, a higher level of quirkiness than life? It's extremely contingent upon a whole string of um, accidents in history. And life is not. Life may be, in which case we're just here. But there are lots of people who think that life arises as a consequence of the chemistry of planets and that that sort of chemistry is likely to happen a number of times. You know? yeah. What is the chance that on another world there was a group of people speaking Anglo-Saxon and another group of people speaking Norman French and one of them happened to invade the other? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it just seems incredibly contingent. Um, in a way that you don't envision for the origin of life on this planet? If that, that could well not be. If it, if it is, then, then there's very unlikely to be life anywhere else. But I say, the, the hypothesis is that okay. because life is a chemical process, there seems to be some link to the chemistry mm -hmm. that goes on in rocks and early Earth and so on, and therefore that might happen somewhere else, then life might happen somewhere else. Now, what do you think are students or the public's biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? Um, I suspect that it's already been answered. Um, so they think that it has been answered, yes, we've seen aliens and they're here among us. So there's a bunch that think we've already seen aliens, we've seen them in the sky or they're among us or they've, you know, there's a face on Mars and all the rest. There's a bunch that have seen too many movies and think, Aren't there aliens out there? I thought they were. I thought Matt Damon found them or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect there's a group that see all these slightly overexcited announcements you see in the press. The latest spacecraft has found, you know, hydrogen on Celadus, and that could be in food stuffs for uh, microbes living. And they misinterpret that because they're somewhat overenthusiastic. Misinterpret that, saying, "Oh, we found life on Enceladus." Uh -huh. um, but um, uh, I. I don't know, I might be massively misjudging public understanding on this, but I, I suspect that'll be the answer. All right, so for the people who don't think that we've already mm -hmm. found aliens, what do you think their biggest misconceptions are? I'm not sure, because... So, so, so I, I, I come through the, uh, the immigration, so I'm... I'm, I'm based in the UK, but I spend quite a bit of time in, in coming across the US, and so every time I come through immigration, they say, why are you coming over here? I explain I'm doing research on astrobiology, search for life, and I almost always get asked some sort of question by the immigration officer. So, you know, they're, they're government workers, they're sort of police-type people, they're not necessarily scientifically educated, they're, I think, random cross-section of the population in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I've had one person say, literally say, oh yeah, my uncle was abducted by aliens, Oh. Um, I've had a couple of others say, oh, so, so what about the latest results from Mars rover? Do you think that detection of methane is real? Mm -hmm. you know, so they're really informed. Mm -hmm. And 
a number of times I've been really pleasantly surprised by how well informed, how technically informed the general public is. Um, so you, what's the biggest, it's really hard to say what's the biggest misconception because some of them have, you know, just see it on, let's not name a channel, but, you know, any lowbrow um, daytime news channel summary. And some of them, you know, rigorously read Scientific American cover to cover. They watch, you know, Discovery Channels. They, they go into websites. I mean, there's fantastic web information out there now that you can dig down as deep as you want and go right back to the primary research papers if you want and mm -hmm. read them. And a surprising number of people, well, surprising to a sort of traditional education view of the world that, you know, there are university people up here and dumb people down there. Um, there aren't at all. There's a whole spread in between. All right, and uh, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists who want to dedicate their lives to trying to answer the question, are we alone? Oh, well, that's sort of, uh, um, I wouldn't advise you to dedicate your life to it. I wouldn't advise anybody to dedicate their life to anything. Um, and that might sound slightly so negative and weird, but um, if you're thinking, hmm, shall I dedicate my life to astrobiology or shall I become a tax accountant? You know, then become a tax accountant. Um, you'll get more respect and they'll shed a load more money and you'll get to work nine to five and it'll be much easier life. If you already have a passion, if something says, wow, you know, spark off. I mean, this, this sort of what, I mean, I have a very long tangled path to, to astrobiology. Um, in fact, a very long tangled path I ended up writing a song about because it's easier describing those things in music than it is in, in, um, in, in, in words. Oh, so let's um, hear it. Why don't you play it for us now? You serious? Yes, yes. Okay. Please, play us your song. Okay, okay. I'll play song. Right, I'll zoom out a little bit so we can... S ow, ow, wah, wah. <laughs> sound right, does it? Well, take your time. We can always edit this part out. If you... <laughs> okay. I edit this part out then. Um, I thought I'd done this before, but it's probably warming up in the room. Uh, maybe, or maybe um, we hit the top against the... Yeah. So you're all tuned up? I'm all tuned up. So what's the name of this song? Um, Tell us about its origin a little bit before you start playing. Oh, so this was some... Um, so I was just thinking of how did I get into astrobiology? Um, and why... Uh, how I ended up being sort of uh, interested in what I do, particularly the chemical aspect, which is looking for, you know, tiny traces of life around the world. And... Um, uh, and, and I realize I've, I've always been interested in it. I mean, it's, it, it's always, this is why I say, you know, if you're thinking, hmm, perhaps I'll do astrobiology or tax accountancy or gardening, you know, mm -hmm. go and do the things that are easy, you make money. If you think, I just need to know this, then that's a different matter. And I've, I, I realize and think about that, I've always, want, always been interested in it, always wanted to know right from, you know, and oddly enough, always been interested in music too, though I'm much better at astrobiology than I am at music, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, we'll see how we go. Uh.
When I was a boy, I looked up with great joy at the lights that shine in the night sky. Because I knew from TV there were worlds there to see, and I'd visit them all by and by. All the men were courageous, the women curvaceous, every planet had breathable air. And the only unknown in my far future home was if William A. Shatner was there. So from that day I knew just what I had to do, I knew what my mission should be. I'd go all the places with alien races known to astrobiology. At high school I found that the planets around were not friendly as shown on TV. And the chances were bad that the soul system had other worlds habitable by me. I learned Mars was too dry, and on Venus you'd fry, on Mercury you'd get more than a tan. And Saturn looked grand, but if you tried to land, you'd be crushed into deep frozen spam. But I did not despair, cause I hoped that up there, somewhere in the wide galaxy, we'd find some strange home when the LGMs Roman could talk astrobiology. At college they said that the life that we led was not average for Earth life at all. And the plants and the fungus would surely outnumber us and microbes would outmass them all. There were bugs in volcanoes, bugs living in ice flows, bugs live ten miles underground. And the aliens we meet wouldn't have hands and feet, they'd be tiny and smelly and round. But I was just fine with finding life signs, though their source was too small to see. Their chemical matter would give me the data to do astrobiology. Last verse. Now I'm an old man, and at long last we can see the planets around other suns. But all that they show is how little we know, and we're pretty much back to square one. But for all our confusion, those worlds in profusion show more habitats than we've dreamt. So we'll keep up our hopes and our big telescopes and we'll work for the happy event. When in the IR of some far distant star those clear spectral life signs we'll see. And at last we'll have shown that we are not alone, all thanks to astrobiology. Very good. So there you go. That's, that's how a, I got into it. That's a lovely song. <laughs> that's a, it's not as, as usually when people put all those scientific words into a song, it's like, it just, it just hurts. Yeah. <laughs> that's very good. Well, there we go. So yeah, um, to come back to your question, I, th I think it's, it's, if you have a passion for doing this, if you feel, you know, this is, and, and, and the truth is, is of science generally. I mean, doing science, really doing science as a career, um, yeah, doing a PhD is long and incredibly hard work and very badly paid and spectacularly frustrating and dull. I mean, when it boils down to it. And the only thing that carries you through it is thinking the excitement that when you actually find something, um, when, you, um, you know, when you see that little nugget of truth in there, um, and you think, wow. Um, I've done a song about that too, but I'm not going to do that one as well. So. <laughs> oh, you're not. Come on. <laughs> that was such a great song. Well, what about Discovery? Uh, about being a scientist. Oh, well, we'd love to hear it. This is an audience of astrobiologists, scientists who would be seriously? like... Seriously? Yes, seriously. Okay, well, you, you, might, you, might need to get, um, you might need to get copyright permission for this, all right, because this isn't my tune. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Okay. If, um, I, if I can't do that, I'll just cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> um... This was actually uh, inspired by uh, the last Absicom when they, they had an open mic evening uh -huh. and a guy did um, a, a fantastic variant on Don McLean's American Pie oh. about what it was like to run Absicom. Oh. And that in inspired me to do another Don McLean song. Okay. Story, story night. 
in the lab at 3 a.m. Hardware has gone down again. The sun will rise before this run is through. This is what we do. Twelve hour days and sixty weeks. Earning just enough to keep the landlord from throwing me out on the street. Now I think I know why my friend. No. I've lost the chords on that one. That's all right, keep on going. Keep on going. Um, uh, okay. Now I think I see why my friends joined consultancies or took that boring job at a Wall Street bank. The ethics of it stank, but they earn in a week more than I do in a year just hanging on in here Starry, starry night Take the red pen to the prose Anything half decent goes Leaves just what even referees can get And it's not published yet and I must write a PhD Trying to make five hard years seem As dull as reading phone directories Now I think I know Why lit majors despise me so My school friend's book reviewed in the Times and Post and all that I can boast is seventh author on a paper in App J, which no one reads anyway. Starry, starry night, data has come through at last. A single point with error bars refutes what we believed just yesterday. What will my PI say? Our pet theory down in flames. Ah, goodbye to tenure and to fame. And I must write a CV yet again. Now I understand. Why the postdocs left and joined a band The same long hours, the same uncertain pay But at the end of day The universe won't turn and say they're wrong You can't refute a song Then the rising sun Lights the data I have won and I feel the thrill of seeing more than anyone has seen before. I found out something beautiful and true. And the world's a little wiser for it. And for me, just that will do. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Excellent. That excellent. needs a bit of editing and splicing in the middle, but <laughs> <laughs> apart from that, yeah. Reminded me of that Van Gogh song. You know that song about Van Gogh? Yeah, that, that's the one. Yeah, is that Starry, Starry Night. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Starry, Starry Night is the Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, one so anyway, sorry. Um, so we derailed slightly off that. No. So why did you become an astrobiologist? Um, I just thought it was fascinating. And, and uh, so there's, the, there's a sort of... Random evolutionary path. It's like sort of how English ended up being English, which was um, uh, my first startup company. Um, I was in the process of being levered out by the by the investors and the, and the people they brought in, um, and I thought, heck, well, I've, I'm sitting at my desk with not very much to do, and I, the company was working on um, using silicon chemistry to make drugs. And I thought, well, I know a shed load about silicon chemistry. Um, always been interested in chemistry of life and stuff. But I'm, I'll look into and write a paper about whether you can have life based on silicon. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And that led to me getting um, invited to talk about this a little workshop. And that led me to get um, invited to a small conference. And that led me to being asked to talk at a big conference. 
and I met my MIT collaborators, Professor Sarah Siegel there, and she said, yeah, really like your talk and um, uh, you know, fascinating stuff. And I said, well, I really like yours too. And what you said is that there's you know, lots of planets out there. If you can tell me, uh, I said, if you can tell me what sort of planets out there, I can think what biochemistry would fit in with them. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, that's a problem because there's every, every sort of planet you can imagine. So if you tell me what biochemistry you can think of, I'll tell you what planet it can fit into. <laughs> and we thought, hmm, there's something to be done there. And that just catapulted the whole, the whole mm -hmm. thing off. Uh, but you know, as I say, I, I, I just have, from, from a, as long as I can remember, I've wanted to know how things work and, and take the lid off and see how the, how the gears work. Um, you know, about, um, particularly about chemistry and biology, less than about, about physics. Uh, you know, so. Okay, and um, let me ask you one more time. Are we alone? Um, the honest answer is I don't know. And um, I... In my gloomier moments, I think we are. I think life is just a spectacularly unlikely event. Um, we why, don't. Why we is that gloomy? Because then all the conferences and the papers and the research saying how do we look for life elsewhere is wasted effort. Um, I mean, it helps us understand us and the universe, and in that sense, it's not wasted. Well, you just wrote uh, a song about all, virtually almost all wasted effort. Yeah, it is. But that little gem, that thing when you find something new, mm -hmm. that is what makes it worthwhile. And the, um, uh, and uh, but if you think you know, I'm doing all this searching, and I'm confident there's nothing there to find, then why am I doing it? Let's well, do, how, let's put the effort in something else. How but I, I no, I I think I don't think we're alone in terms of is there other life out there? I think we may well be effectively alone in, in the sense of other, is there other communicating intelligence out there? Because for the reasons I've outlined, I think intelligence that communicates in a way that we could understand could maybe, be really short-lived. Maybe you can help me out with this, because you used in this interview about maybe 50 times the word life, and yet you also said that you didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Does that, is that hypocritical, or is that just irresponsible, or what is that? I think I can't define in rigorous terms what it is. I can recognize characteristics of it. Um, I say, my, for me, this coded replication and coded self-propagation thing is a key characteristic. So in um, the history of our lineage, before there was coded, replica, re coded replication, mm -hmm. it wasn't life. Is that, your, is that your definition, working definition? That would be my working definition, or to put it another way, how non-coded geochemistry, if you want to put it like that, acquired the ability to store coded information in it is a core bit of the transition from non-life to life. I'm not sure there was a hard, you know, yesterday it was just lots of complicated chemicals and today it's life moment. I mean, there must, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's like saying, when, what is a hill and what is a mountain? But the important um, part of that transition in your mind is coded information. It's coded information stored within the life. It's semi-coded information. Um, I'm not sure you're going to have to it's either. It's, um, so fairly soon you're going to ask me, what do I mean by coded information? Well, I, I um, would, but we don't have time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, no, but er so, almost so, everything so, yeah, you can I, talk about it has some steps to yeah. do it. And if you look carefully, you say, whoa, that happened, that happened, that happened. Yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Um, uh, I, I don't know the answers to these things. Okay. And I think finding out the answers is, is part of the excitement, thinking, and, you know, I'm, I mean, just talking with people but, like you. But, you but ask me difficult questions, like, hmm, that's tricky. But finding out the answers to questions that don't make sense is not the way to go, right? But you don't know whether they don't make sense. Right. Okay. This this is the this is the problem and the excitement around um, how you uh, yeah, the, the, this whole field. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're working on how to engineer a bridge, you know the questions you should be asking, and you know there's classes of answers how to do it, um, and it's an exciting and great thing to do, but it's very well defined. For this, we, we're not even sure what it is we're looking for and how to, how to look for it. And we just have to say, look, given what we know about what we think is a, lot, a living thing on Earth, you know, we agree that we're living. Um, 
we agree that you know this chair is not living. Um, or maybe, well, I agree it is. I don't know if you agree, but I agree this chair is not living. There are intermediate things like viruses, um, which sort of could be or could not be. So we say, well, um, is the virus living? Is it not living? Does it actually matter whether we answer that question? If we found a planet covered in viruses, but with no other thing that is anything like living, then we'd have to decide whether a virus was living or not. Um, so it's a one-dimensional scale you've just created. Living to non-living. It's not an n-dimensional scale. There are not an n, an n number of ways of being alive. That might be. Um, well, then you can't talk about living or non-living. But, but I, think, I think we only have one example. Right. And if you have one point there and one point there, you, you draw a line between them. I mean, any, you know, th th this is high school graphics that you, you shouldn't do that if you're trying to plot a function. You must have multiple points and draw a curve through them, not just two points. But we only have two points. So, you know, that's the best we can do.